how can I get everyone to like Gordon Johnson? It's like, that's so interesting to me. And I had a little like back and forth with him on Twitter yesterday. And he was a little condescending back. Like, boy, are you like insecure? What's going on here? Like, I'm wondering why you're taking that tone. So like, that's what I think about all the time. I'm like, okay. But now part of me, I'm like, fuck, I really want you on the channel now. Like, I really want you on the channel because I'm trying to like figure out how to get you to be more comfortable in who you are, not be like so maybe offended by these things in a way. But like, how can we get people to see you as a human being and not as a clown? And I don't think he's a clown. I just think his approach is misplaced and not correct in this scenario. But yeah, I, maybe I'm weird. Maybe I see my, a lot of myself in Gordon in a way, like being sort of a, you know, not necessarily bullied, but picked on. And again, he doesn't help himself, I must say. But at the same time, wouldn't it be so cool if Gordon becomes a voice that we can reference to test our biases, but one that we don't view as a clown or a moron or whatever, like a legitimate voice that, yes, he might be the most bearish voice out there about the company, Tesla in this case, but it's one we respect. Maybe that's how I can help him in a way. Maybe he doesn't know how to do that. And so I kind of want to help him go through that hump and be like, yo, this is how you really become a, a very trusted voice. Even if you're like super against the company, being trusted is very, very important. And this is how you do it. But again, he needs to accept that. And I need to maybe I'm projecting too much of my, I want to help him with this, you know, uh, mm -hmm. onto him, which uh, again, it, it could be its own separate thing. I think I trust people way more than most people do. I really think that if you give people a chance like if you do so in an honest manner, they're going to be very respectful of that trust and they're not going to screw you over. And mm -hmm. I think I developed that over my career because that's really how I was able to build good teams and I was able to build things that were impactful was trust. It all starts with trust. All of it starts with trust. And of course, as a brand new manager, a brand new sort of team lead, I... I didn't know what the hell I was doing, but I always started with a standpoint of, I'm going to treat you how I want to be treated. And I'm going to make sure that I do anything I can to, to, to help you do your job as best as possible, because that's what I would like. And that's what I got. I, I think I, I was very lucky in my mentorship too at Phillips because Jess was my manager and she was really good at that. She gave me a lot of guidance from that respect. And over time, I gained a lot of really great mentors at Phillips too. So They've had a huge impact on me as far as learning how to trust people, how to build teams, how to do those things. And ultimately, when you put that into practice, you start to find out that people really value that. People really value being trusted, especially with big projects. And then doubly so if you're always there to help them through a tough time or you help them through a problem they're having without any judgment, with zero fear of losing their job ensuring that they know that they're not going to be looked upon negatively, but at the same time, drawing very clear guidelines that say, as long as you're trying really hard, and I can see that you're trying really hard, I trust you. I trust you. Some people take longer than others, but I trust you. That's huge. So I started developing that at Phillips. I was definitely not very good at it, especially to start, but over time I got better. And then Tesla took it to a brand new level, to a brand new level because I was in a completely different environment. It was very non-traditional, very startup-y, and very existential. Again, like we were running into deadlines 24-7 yeah. of the largest magnitude. So I had no choice but to trust people as much as humanly possible. And what it taught me is, wow, if you surround yourself with the smartest people on earth and you trust all of them, like you're going to get a really good batting average <laughs> when it comes to getting stuff done. It's okay to make mistakes. I was very afraid to make mistakes early on. And I would beat myself up over it so hard because I took a lot of pride in being the fastest and most accurate person. And then when I made a mistake, I'd be like, oh my God, I'm literally the worst worker ever. How could anybody trust me? Lack of confidence. I, I think I would make progress faster if I did that. And then when I made a mistake, I'd be like, okay, it's just part of the learning process. Just take pride in your work and iterate. It's okay to fail. And just be honest, be like, hey, listen, I'm sorry. I screwed up, but this is what we're going to do to move forward. That seems like a very normal thing to do now. But I was too emotionally tied to making a mistake is bad. And it wasn't until like recently in my career that I'm like, 
making a mistake is good. As long as you're honest about it and you're really trying your best and you ensure you're giving people a reason to trust you. That's an important prerequisite that the reason that you failed was because you were trying. I wish that I had understood sooner that being authentic and honest and straightforward with failing in that context actually builds trust and respect faster. It's easy to believe early on that doing those things is going to take credibility down a notch when in fact it actually increases it. Huge. I think you have to feel it to really learn from it. But I think the thing that could be helpful is know what to expect. You know, know what to expect. And that's why my mentorship line, if there is like one sentence I want on my tombstone when I like die is feel comfortable feeling uncomfortable and it encapsulates that feeling. Like there's so many things that happen in the person's life or career that lead to them shying away from a challenge or feeling like they're not good enough or having a lot of confidence issues. It's because they have a lot of discomfort and fear. I'm like, no, that's the feeling that is good. That's the feeling you want. If you're feeling that feeling, you're learning something. And if you're not learning, you're not improving. So seek it out, you know? So to the point where if I don't feel that feeling, I'm like, okay, I'm freaking out now because I'm not feeling like I'm uncomfortable. So like I seek discomfort in a way. It's like the, I'm like, there's something wrong. But it's very important for career building, but in an honest manner, not just like jump from job to job to job, you know, get your resume looking good. There's people out there that don't do a lot but they make a lot of money and they don't necessarily bring value. They just know how to appear like they're doing a lot of work. Those are counterproductive. Those people are soaking up resources that are not being allocated correctly. And this Twitter thing is going to be insane. Like people are going to yeah. see it firsthand. This is just the beginning. It's going to be freaking wild. I'm so excited. Wait until people see how it actually is to innovate quickly. It's crazy. But it's way uncomfortable. People in their minds think that a culture of innovation that moves really quickly and it builds incredible things is like this rainbow road, right? It's not. Mm -hmm. It sucks really bad. It hurts. It's wild. But that's what it takes. The insane thing is that Elon himself hasn't moved away from that type of culture. Because I think in his head, like... He knows from a first principle standpoint, this is how to get maximal results is to never waver from this culture. And he can't physically be, be subject to entropy because his brain will not allow him because his brain is like, this is not the maximal way to, to produce a great result. So like to him, it's illogical because we know, we know he's also on the spectrum, like folks like are, they're incredibly logical in their approach. And so like, it does it hurt him emotionally, physically, like to his soul, I'm sure it does. But his brain's like, no, you can't. This is crazy. Like, you can't do this. No, you have to be maximally efficient. <laughs> Here's the deal. I think the problem solving and intelligent aspect of him getting to those solutions is less impressive than his ability to fight entropy. Because fighting the entropy is what allows him to be in that state of mind constantly. Like he's, he seems to be in flow state all the time because he literally can't do anything else, I think, in his head. It, it doesn't allow him to be outside of that flow state. I, obviously, he's brilliant. He's very, very smart. But I think his problem-solving skills are probably much closer to the regular person than most people realize is that he pushes through the pain and pushes through the distractions because he, he just cannot stop focusing. So it's a question of focus. So if you're really focused on something, I really believe anybody can fight it, but uh, a lot of us are mere mortals. So is he, but he just is willing to, he can't help himself, but to go through those things. And that's what's, like, I wish I could talk to the guy in one of our panels, right? If I have him for three hours, this is the kind of stuff I would try to pick his brain on. Like, yeah, you're, you're smart, obviously, but like, Talk to me about pain. Talk to me about your focus levels. Talk to me about, like, I'll put him in so many different situations. Be like, how would you handle this? How would you handle this? How would you handle this? And I think the lessons we will learn from that would be like, wow, okay, he's actually way more like a regular person that we expected. It's just his ability to focus on something super, super, super hard is really his superpower. And his, like you said, the ability to fight entropy all the time and then ensuring everyone gets held accountable to that same standard is truly what allows him to build what he does. 
And is that a thing that can be learned? Is Elon the first re one or re one of the very first ones that are able to do that, that we can study and maybe more people are willing to do that and adopt that sort of methodology for building things? Who knows? It's a very interesting use case. And uh, it's wild, dude. The way I take risks is when I feel like there's very minimal downside risk are the ones that I gravitate towards. And meaning that the worst thing that could happen is that I fail and I move forward. So I never do anything that say is existential. For example, while I was at Phillips, I was a hundred thousand plus in debt. I had a job that was paying at the time, probably like 50 grand a year. I lived with my parents and I had 15,000 bucks in savings and I had credit card debt. I'm like, okay, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> I need to figure something out. And so the way I viewed that viewpoint, I'm like, okay, so I have 15,000 bucks in my bank account. I'm really in debt, but I trust in myself to be able to continue generating money in the future. Like I, I feel like if I work at this job as hard as I can, I'm going to have income that's going to allow me to survive for as long as I want, especially if I don't live a lifestyle that is like crazy, like partying all the time and spending a bunch of money. So I framed it in that sense. I'm like, okay, so as long as I do that, I can take every penny I have and throw it into something I believe in. So in my head, I'm like, there's no way I can fail or the failure, it has to be, come from me literally collapsing and dying or like, or getting hit by a truck and I'm in, and I can't have a job. As long as I can have a job, I can take every penny I have and put it into something I believe in because I trust in myself, right? If I'm, I'm not making enough money, I lower my standard of living. So what am I willing to lower my standard of living to? Living in a box, literally. Like that's what it takes. A lot of people will look at me and be like, you're a moron. <laughs> like that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard, right? Because, because there is a lot of self-sacrifice. But for me, I find the most joy which is weird, I find a lot of joy in making those things happen. And if that worst case scenario does appear, I have a lot of belief in myself that I'm going to lower my standard of living to where it needs to be so I can continue on that path because ultimately that's what's most important. And I think that mechanism allows me to take a lot more risks than maybe some because I'm willing to make a sacrifice. And that's the biggest thing that I've learned is if you are trying to balance... Um, nice things with getting stuff done, you've already started on a losing mm -hmm. foot, you know?